So this, this blue circle here represents how many people are dying from the effects of atherosclerosis, basically coronary heart disease and stroke. Um, and uh, the message that I'd like you to take away from this meeting um, is one, generally speaking, for general practitioners in primary care. Think of a youngish patient who comes to you in his mid 40s or early 50s, where you identify some of the risk factors for coronary heart disease. And after dealing with the obvious lifestyle factors, such as smoking and diet, alcohol consumption, what's the next most important thing? And I hope to convince you that the most important thing at that stage is not so much as blood cholesterol as anti-hypertensive -anti management. I think the cholesterol story has been rather oversold. And one of the reasons for that is because statins are undoubtedly effective, but I hope to be able to show you that statins exert this effect through their anti-inflammatory effect on the vessel wall and not through their cholesterol lowering effect. So chasing cholesterol targets is probably irrational. Once we've given the patient an appropriate dose of statins, uh, if they need statins, then the thing to follow, the target of treatment should be their blood pressure. Um, there's a lot more about in the atherosclerotic plaque, of course, than simply cholesterol accumulation. And uh, what we see in the plaque when we examine it down the microscope are basically inflammatory cells, monocytes, macrophages, um, T lymphocytes, fibroblasts, and secondary smooth muscle hypertrophy. So there's a great deal going on here. Um, and it's interesting that what's going on is at points of mechanical stress. And if it was just a question of cholesterol, uh, we'd expect to see atherosclerosis laid down rather like a layer of paint. Um, but it's not. It's laid down in kinks or bends in the arterial tree, and places where the external wall is fixed, like the abdominal aorta to the lumbar spine, um, and at the sides of branch vessels. And you can see this uh, whenever you look at an arterial gram prior to a femoropopsial bypass, for example, that the um, place where you tend to get the little deposits of atheroma are at the branches of the collateral vessels. We also see it prematurely in cases where the arterial wall is mechanically stiffened, such as in the progeria syndromes, uh, Huntington, Clifford, and uh, Werner syndrome, um, and in situations where the stiffness is a result of diabetes, type 1 diabetes. It again suggests that arterial wall stiffness uh, has an effect uh, mechanically on the strain across the artery determined atheroma, determining atherosclerosis lay down. Blood viscosity seems to have a role also. Uh, we know from the uh, Edinburgh Artery Study and also from studies from Blood Transfusion Service and a recent study from Finland that regular blood donors um, have a lower blood viscosity, and this is associated with a lower cardiovascular mortality. The effect of blood pressure has been well established since the Framingham study in the 1960s. Um, and we also have a series of experimental works involving the endothelial stripping experiments that demonstrates if you damage the arterial wall, you can produce atherosclerosis-like lesions. So this, to my mind, uh, adds up to a fair amount of circumstantial evidence that we've got a driving force here that is mechanical strain. And even if uh, we were to discount that, then there's little doubt in my mind that mechanical strain is important in terms of how atherosclerosis causes harm. Uh, apart from uh, stenosis of the artery, simply limiting flow, um, the main ways in which an atherosclerotic plaque will cause harm is by detaching from the wall of the underlying artery and giving rise to either platelet embolism, transit ischemic attacks, local thrombosis, acute coronary infarction, uh, or wall dissection. And clearly, mechanical forces are involved in this process of dissection. Uh, although research uh, uh, efforts have been directed more at the things that may reduce the binding of the atherosclerotic uh, plaque to the underlying vessel wall. And it's for all these reasons that I think that this is important. And that is why uh, in my retirement, I built this little machine, um, the object uh, of which is to uh, look at the uh, way in which the principal mechanical variables might interact uh, to give rise to the stresses that cause plaque dissection and probably initiate atherosclerosis. Um, the machine enables us to vary the principal uh, variables uh, such as pulse rate, blood pressure, systolic and diastolic, um, fluid viscosity, 
uh, using different uh, isotonic sucrose saline solutions, giving us a range of dynamic viscosity between 1 and 1 1.7 MPAs. And arterial wall stiffness uh, by uh, exposing the arterial wall to formalin vapor for various periods of time, uh, by which we can give a range of stiffnesses uh, according to a Young's modulus between about 430 and uh, 4000 kPa, which incidentally is the same degree of stiffness that you uh, can detect in a, an atheromatous aorta, um, and also in one that's subjected to a very high blood pressure. That's a sort of limiting stiffness, uh, which occurs after formaldehyde exposure for 24 hours. Um, the other thing about the machine that I'd like to point out is that we can change the pulse pressure wave profile uh, by driving a piston uh, using a different set of set, set different cams of different uh, form profiles to produce a different set of pulse pressure waves, uh, ones with sharp peaks and ones with blunt peaks. So these are things that we can vary on this machine to study how they interact to affect the issue of stiffness across the arterial, of, um, stress across the arterial wall, I'm sorry. Uh, we can change the rate of pulsation, the diastolic pressure, the systolic pressure, as I mentioned, the fluid viscosity by using sucrose solutions, um, the mean arterial pressure, obviously, which is a function of the systolic and diastolic uh, and the shape of the pressure wave, the pulse waveform, and using the uh, formula, we can alter the stiffness of the arterial wall uh, through a various range of stiffnesses. Um, so just to explain a little bit further, the uh, nature of the machine, how it works, uh, the, we have a, uh, basically, we have a fluid reservoir containing uh, the uh, fluid that we're fusing a vessel with. It's, uh, this is passed through a primary return circuit using a pump and a return valve by which we can produce varying input pressure, which goes into the test artery, flows through the test artery, and out through a variable pressure barostatic valve, which enables us to control the outflow resistance. And pulsatility is imposed on this uh, column of blood using a syringe, uh, which is operated uh, by a cam. And as I said earlier, the profile of that cam can be changed in order to uh, change the nature of the pulse pressure wave. And the output variables, the things we can measure, are the <clears throat> centripetal stress across the inner surface of the arterial wall, the strain reaction of the inner wall using a deformable um, latex pseudo intima, <clears throat> excuse me, spelling the timing of the displacement, um, and the diameter of the arterial wall in its response uh, to changes in arterial pressure. The artery itself is a pig artery. We've used a pig artery uh, because uh, the porcine artery resembles mechanically and in terms of uh, diameters, uh, the human artery, the human aorta. Um, and uh, the hemodynamic variables of the pig, the pulse rate, blood pressure, and so forth is very similar to that of human beings. And this artery is uh, lined, as I mentioned earlier, by a deformable latex due to intima to simulate the uh, intima of the artery. And that enables us to see its displacement during the course of the press, uh, pressure wave uh, passing through, and also enables us to measure the differential pressure between the subintimal space uh, and the adjacent lumen of the vessel. And this is measured with a static bolt. In other words, it's not subject to variable uh, to dynamic pressure changes, and this is measured using a perfused catheter. And the outputs from this uh, will be um, what we observe through the ultrasound probe in terms of changes in the arterial wall diameter and wall thickness, um, and changes in the pressure occurring across the vessel wall, the stress, in other words, and the strain reactions, uh, and that is recorded simultaneously using a dual channel pressure recorder. So we have a dual channel pressure recorder here we have the pulse pressure wave, and here we have the corresponding pressure wave uh, uh, stressing the inner arterial wall. Uh, and uh, here we have in uh, movement mode, ultrasound, end mode ultrasound, a play out of how the, it, the force intima displaces during the pas passage of the pressure wave. And there is the artery open. You can see how closely the force intima lines the artery, simulating the true intima. Excuse me. <coughs> Now, results. So starting off just looking at uh, what happens to an artery when you raise the pressure in it, this is not using pulsatile flow, but just simply raising the pressure in it uh, progressively through the normal uh, pressure range from hypertensive normal pressure 
uh, hypertensive range, we have a three-phase response. In the first uh, phase, corresponding to a hypotensive, if you like, a pig, shocked pig, uh, we have a fairly rapid rise uh, in linear rise in diameter of the artery uh, as the pressure slowly starts to rise. And as the artery sort of becomes aware of distension, the, it's, this is a living artery, um, its wall thickens slightly as the smooth muscle contracts in the media. Throughout the normal operating range of pressure, we have a slightly reducing linear response as young, the Young's modulus, the stiffness of the arterial wall, reduces at the upper end of the normal range. And that is associated with a very linear wall thinning. And then we reach the maximum compliance of the artery when further di 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 dilatation of the artery is limited by the outer adventitia, which is made of connective tissue, uh, collagen. And at this point, the wall reaches its maximum thinness. Um, <clears throat> and so, uh, We've got a three-phase response here, which is rather what you might expect to see. Now, it gets interesting, though, um, when we look at the Young's modulus uh, corresponding to its dilatation, we see this Young's modulus is a measure of stiffness. It's very, very flaccid, goes through phase two, and then it reaches phase three. And as it reaches phase three, we reach the maximum level of stiffness that corresponds to the sort of stiffness that occurs uh, in a hypertensive pig, or hypertensive human, or indeed in a diseased artery once already been affected by severe atherosclerotic degeneration. What happens in positive flow? Um, this is when it gets interesting. So here we are uh, putting in positive flow down the artery and measuring the compliance of the arterial wall. In other words, it's res uh, the response of its diameter to a fixed pressure change, in this case, one millimeter of mercury, as we raise the mean arterial pressure in it. So here again, we've got three phase responses, and over the normal operating range, this what you call a sort of normal tensive to mild hypertension, we see uh, as a, quite a marked, and this is a logarithmic scale here, quite a marked drop off. So there's a logarithmic drop off in compliance as we go across the normal range and hypertensive range. So a 10% uh, rise in mean arterial pressure give rise to a 20% reduction in uh, arterial wall compliance. And how does that play through um, uh, in terms of um, what happens to the, the main hemodynamic variables? It's quite interesting because here we've, we've hardened the arterial wall using formalin for six, nine, 24 hours exposure. And we can see using exactly the same input uh, pressure wave and outflow resistance that as we stiffen the arterial wall, the pulse wave, the pulse pressure increases and the pulse wave becomes sharper peaked. And that is rather interesting because when we look at what influences the um, uh, stress across the arterial wall measured by our pressure probes, it's an absolutely linear correlation and a very, very close correlation, an R value of 0.97 between uh, the transmural strain and the pulse pressure. And that's keeping the wave waveform constant. To get that correlation, we need to use the same waveform, the same, in this case, we've used a kind of slightly blunted peak waveform characterized by an area under the peak of uh, 3.5 little squares on our, um, I can talk about that later, but anyhow, it, it basically we've categorized the waveforms according to the area under the peak within 40 millimeters of mercury of the peak. If on the other hand, <clears throat> we keep the um, mean arterial pressure constant to maintain us in the same range of arterial wall compliance, the thing that's affecting uh, transmural strain uh, is now becomes the sharpness of the pressure peaks. And those are the only two things of all the variables we've been able to play with that really makes a difference. We haven't been able to demonstrate any great change with changes in viscosity, um, but we have been able to demonstrate this very interesting interplay between arterial wall stiffness, either produced by hypertension or by artificially stiffening the arterial wall and the shape and volume of the pulse pressure wave. So it looks as though we have a rather complicated interplay here in which the main determinants of arterial wall stiffness are pulse pressure and waveform. Um, main, uh, main, I about the main determinants of uh, transmural strain are pulse pressure and waveform. And these are in turn determined by arterial wall stiffness, which in turn is determined by mean arterial pressure. So if we were to look at this in a, a sort of a, a more uh, global fashion, 
uh, it, uh, we could say that we seem to have a situation in which arterial wall stiffness can be affected by uh, disease, atherosclerosis, and we've seen, in fact, that we get the same young nodulus out of an atherosclerotic aorta as we do out of a hypertensive aorta, as we do have it out of a, an aorta that's been restricted to formula in for 24 hours. Diabetes, increased arterial wall stiffness, but the main determinant of arterial wall stiffness in a healthy artery is the mean arterial pressure. So we've got a vicious circle in operation, as uh, so that um, <clears throat> we raise the mean arterial pressure, the artery gets stiff, we get a more stressful pulse waveform, that <clears throat> we get a more peaked pulse waveform, and that gives rise uh, to a vicious circle, which involves, in the first place, atherosclerosis. It involves the fact that endothelial cells are mechanosensitive. We know this from the cell culture experiments. And when they get stressed, they produce surface adhesion molecules that result in uh, inflammatory cells, uh, monocytes, platelets, and leukocytes adhering to them and translocating into the subintima, which is what we see in atherosclerosis. And interestingly enough, it's that process that is blocked by statins, not through their cholesterol lowering properties, uh, but through something called the mavalonic acid pathway, which is separate from cholesterol lowering. And uh, quite interesting, that produces the inflammatory reaction. Um, and so we have a vicious circle. Um, and the conclusions, I think, from this is that one could really almost regard um, atherosclerosis being a repetition strain injury, rather like uh, tendonitis of the elbow, for example, that you've got a situation where hypertension, uh, particularly a raised pulse pressure and raised mean arterial pressure, causes an insult to the arterial wall that results in inflammation, as any mechanical insult does. But because that mechanical insult continues, the process of healing is impaired, and you have a sustained inflammatory healing response from this over, overforce and overrange injury. And it's rather interesting that we find exactly the same uh, cytokines, same inflammatory markers uh, in repetition strain injury as we find in the arterial wall affected by atherosclerosis, the same increase uh, in the same IL-1, IL-6, TNF and all that um, associated with that inflammation and very similar histological changes. So I'm aware we're running, I'm running slightly behind time. I just want to say that I think the logical conclusions from this, if one was to extrapolate to logical conclusions, one could say that if, to go back to the first question, if you're confronted by a relatively healthy, young middle-aged male or female who's slightly hypertensive, has some risk factors, and you've done the basic things of stopping them from smoking, you might want to consider uh, taking measures to keep their mean arterial pressure within normal limits uh, to stop the process of um, increased stiffness arising that results in this mechanical strain that precipitates the atherosclerotic uh, business later in life. But if you already are dealing with a stiffened artery in a person of my sort of age, um, or somebody with primary diabetes, then probably your targets, appropriate targets to reduce the stress are pulse pressure and waveform. And I'm not sure what we can do about waveform, but we can certainly carefully reduce pulse pressure so long as we're not dealing with the critical stenosis somewhere in the system. Um, and perhaps we shouldn't be too ready to drop the diastolic pressure. This might be the explanation of why in the all hat study there was an increased mortality in the group getting doxies in because of dropping their diastolics, I suspect. Um, so anyway, uh, that's basically the message. Anybody's interested uh, in doing a little study to see if um, uh, HSCRP might be a good marker for this sort of uh, inflammatory reaction to stress and whether treating blood pressure lowers it uh, should contact me. Um, I, it's been a great privilege talking to you this afternoon. I'd like to just show you this picture. It's really, I rather love it. Uh, thanks to Medicine Sans Frontier. Some years ago, I found myself in uh, Chechnya in the Caucasus Mountains, where you've probably heard people tend to live a long time. And I had calls to operate on this old man who had a strangulated hernia He's a member of the village council, he's a delightful old chap. Um, <clears throat> he's 98 years old, his blood pressure was 105 over 68, steady pulse rate. And as I was operating on his hernia, I noticed that all his friends were gathering around the uh, door of the operating theater, peering in to see how the thing was going. I was doing it under local, so we were able to chat. <laughs> and um, they were all equally elderly and equally fit. And we measured their blood pressures and they were all amazingly, uh, astonishing, you know, blood, blood, low blood pressures their age. I, it's completely anecdotal, but these people take a lot of exercise. They don't eat a lot of meat. They eat a lot of yogurt and they take a lot of garlic, which um, 
uh, may well uh, play a role in maintaining the elasticity of your larger blood vessels, which I think is a very critical factor. Uh, so thank you very much indeed, everybody, for your attention. Uh, this is my email address if anyone was interested in that study of uh, uh, HSCRP, whether it comes down when you treat your blood pressure, please get in touch. I'm trying to get some funds for it. Uh, that's something I wrote recently, which uh, can fill you in on the background of why I've mounted all these arguments, because I haven't had time to show you all the evidence. Um, and I'd like to invite anybody to ask any questions they want to. Um, I think I'm just within time. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thomas, for sharing your extraordinary research work. Thank Hi, you. Doctor. Hi. Well, I, I would like to to congratulate you because it was a really interesting thing. And I, I would like to ask you something. Have you tried this uh, machine or, or this uh, dispositive on patients with sepsis or, or septic shock to determine the response to catecholamines? Oh, what a fantastically interesting question. Uh, um, talk about septic shock. Um, that's, uh, that's a picture of an endothelial cell, okay? Um, and, uh, uh, it would be fascinating to do exactly what you say because the machine's working on pig aorters. Um, so I'm not using it on patients, but it would be quite an interesting thing to look at the effect of uh, subjecting the artery to uh, endotoxin and to see what happens. But this is a transmission electron microscope that I think, a uh, picture, which I think is facing an endothelial cell um, in an artery, in, a, in an artery that has, uh, in which I've released some endotoxin, basically. And you see how this cell, which protects us from thrombosis and platelet accumulation, all the rest of it, um, sits here, bound onto the interval collagen by little foot processes. And here is a junction, here is the uh, intercellular junction with the next intercellular endothelial cell. And you have to think, what are the consequences uh, of these uh, cells coming off? What are the consequences of these tight junctions becoming loose junctions in response to sepsis um, or other insults? And of course, it's the exposure of the circulating blood to the subendothelial collagen. We all know what that does. You get your uh, platelet and fibrin accumulation, uh, fibrin is turning to fibrin, and you get a, very quickly get a clot forming, thrombus forming, that when organized, has all the elements of an atherosclerotic plaque. Um, so, jolly good question. Um, I think it would be a very interesting thing to explore. I, I have looked at the effects of nicotine on the arterial wall in terms of its mechanical properties and the effects of incubating the artery for up to 48 hours in uh, diabetic sort of style glucose solutions. And I wasn't able to demonstrate with my rather crude machine, and it is crude, any change uh, in the um, compliance of the arterial wall. But that was a pretty crude study, I have to say, using very primitive instruments. I haven't got a great equipment here. But thank you for your question. <laughs>